all the stay online as uh, Scott and Scott uh, give us a presentation on uh, pools and environmental uh, efficiency uh, for both the short term and the long term. Scott Bowron and I have uh, been uh, having a little bit of a uh, discussion regarding, uh, you know, pool design considerations. And uh, I invited Scott from Clearview Aquatics to come on over here and uh, give us, uh, get, uh, share, share his knowledge. So Scott, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Paul, and thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here and to talk with you. Uh, I want to make sure you can see my shared screen. Somebody can confirm that. I can, yep. Yep, perfect. All right. So uh, I understand it's going to be recorded for future. I see the recording button on, so I'll just proceed as if there's 100 people in the room. So uh, my name is Scott Byron. I'm president of Clear Aquatics, and I'm going to do a preamble discussion today and uh, see what uh, we can bring to the table for for you in the, the county as you look to uh, at a new pool and what what does that possess uh, also on the call today is Scott Volke director of asset solutions and strategy with MRSCO so I talked to Scott uh, about you folks and thought it was a good fit to bring him in and talk to you folks as well and I'm going to do sort of uh, in the facility and Scott's more of a, a the whole asset solution and and working with people to develop strategies for getting money and and how does a carbon neutral type facility look like really taking your facility and looking at as you build a new facility instead of just saying we have to get a bunch of money and stick it into a, a building how can we make it truly first class looking forward and 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 making it a different approach or a different angle to what people normally do with when they put uh, facilities in. So that's really what we want to have is that discussion and where where can we go and how does it look like? How can we get there? And then at the end, we had uh, applied to plan to do questions and answers, but we'll hold those off and you folks can either write them down or we'll come back on a call in the future and, and work through the questions that you may have as a group. Because it's important that everybody has some sort of input, just questions, concerns. How does this work? Uh, it, is, it is new and it's a huge investment for any location. So you want to make sure that you have your answers, uh, questions answered and that you're ready to go. So some basic facts on pools. Uh, my background actually is, is in a recreational facility maintenance and operations. I was a rec manager for the city of London for most of my career. Uh, I ran about 80 complexes, uh, operations and maintenance. I'm very well versed in the aquatic side of systems, and uh, that's sort of my background on the, the quick. I also got into project management with the city. We built a lot of new complexes, and including indoor facilities and multiple outdoor facilities while I was there, and I was part of that team that we, we grew. So uh, I've since retired from the city of London and started a company where I helped places get moving forward and pretty much everything I do is green energy of some source base. So I speak across Canada on rec facilities, on pool management, um, all kinds of safety aspects. So pretty broad range. So why do we build a pool? And uh, really we do it for our community. It's uh, the kids. Everybody says we build a pool for children and yeah, that's true. Uh, we need to have pools for kids to learn to swim to for entertainment and enjoyment. Uh, drowning is the number one cause of death for one to four year olds in North America. And that's uh, we live in water world, so we have to make sure they're prepared and that's learn to swim. So learn to swim really is not just something you do for fun. It's a job or a life skill that we want to have much like riding a bike that idea. Aging population. The second piece is aging population. And we, when we build a pool, everybody thinks big square tank and away you go. And uh, what does that mean? Well, the average age in Canada is now over 54 years old outside the GTA. Uh, it's changing in, in its look and it's changing in, in how we respond. And that aging population is wants to be active, active lifestyles. They still do competitive swimming. They still do learn to swim. They use, uh, they huff and puff all kinds of different things. 
And then the third component in your community is competition. And competition always brings more life to the pool. And the fact that uh, competitive teams and, and that growth of that market is huge. Since the uh, last Olympics, uh, Penny Alexiak, Kylie Mass, all those folks who are now international names and quite fr frankly, uh, the history of swimming in Canada is quite strong, but it's becoming even bigger with those young folks. Uh, the Canadian government spent a lot of money years ago developing a swim program and out of that is coming these champions, much like you're seeing in the tennis program where there's athletes now succeeding on the international stage because the groundwork was set years ago. Uh, huge growth in competitive swimming, in swimming lessons, in people wanting to participate in swimming. And it really emerged after the last Olympics or in around that time. As your communities grow, uh, you have to adapt to them. People don't move into your community because it's got nice roads. People move into your community because it's got great amenities. It's got places for me to go, places for my family to go. What do I do? How can I keep myself happy and how can I be a healthy community? So that always has to be thought of. And uh, quite frank, I, I was at a, a AMO conference last year with Nick Nanos uh, was speaking and he does um, <laughs> what makes community grow. He did a chat to, to the municipal governments and he said, you have to stop talking about roads and start talking about wellness and health and all those parts and pieces of your community because that's what people want to hear, not just we have a great sewer system. Just a, you know, a word and a thought that I always hit, hit me strong. We have to grow. What do people want to live in my community? And then the third community is obligation. So I mentioned drowning. We want to keep people ha active and healthy. And that's all part and parcel of a great community. People will travel to get great recreation. That's, that's given. But they want it within a certain realm and an envelope. They want to feel like their community offers them that good feeling. If people are healthy, they're well, and they're out of the hospitals. And that's all part of that. How do you save money and keep people healthy? So that's a bigger overarching type of mentality and philosophy. When you build that facility, what does it need to do? and What does it need to have? Well, I use sustainable three times here. One is energy efficient, which is really what we're talking about today. What is energy efficiency? So you, you can build all kinds of things. What Scott's going to go around uh, and discuss a little bit, Scott Volke will talk about. And that's the envelope and in, in the outside and the parts and pieces. What I'm talking about is the inside. You have to have energy efficient systems in order to make that energy efficient envelope even more uh, sustainable. So those are things that we need to think about as we build our new facilities. The first zero uh, net neutral pool is now being built in Canada and that's a sign of things to come. And we want to be on that bandwagon and on that thinking as a community. Pools are not known for being low energy systems. We have to really work at making them that way. So it starts with great equipment and starting with uh, smart thinking. The operation and functional part of it. We build this thing and it's fantastic and it looks great the first day. How is it operational and how is it functional for a long term? We build facilities somewhere between 35 and 50 years. We need them to operate for a long time in that realm and we need them to be sustainable. You don't want to be build something that looks good and feels good, but it only lasts two years. So you want to good, use good equipment that's proven and, and it's going to move your, your whole team forward. And proven equipment installed, again, really just putting good stuff in at the beginning. If you... Uh, build a, build a really pretty car, but don't give it a good engine. It's gonna it's gonna fail on you. And you want to really work at making it uh, solid at the beginning. So, uh, Clear Aquatics, where are we? We're a sales and training. We are a company that offers advanced chemistry, smart installation equipment. Everything I do and every part of what we do is uh, green energy or green technology philosophy. Uh, from training to the equipment and the, the advice that we give. So those are all part and parcel of what we are. 
We are known around uh, for operational consideration, consideration to maximize performance within that facility. And just thinking about it from the grassroots, I'm an operations-based person. I always think of it from the person who's going to actually run it because uh, we want to make sure that's uh, fathomable and functional. And then we want to have an efficient system. You need to start with efficient equipment. So everything that I'm involved with is tried and true. It's not something that we just came up with today. So the first piece I'm going to talk about is called Mirtha Technology. And uh, Mirtha is the world's largest pool company. It has official partners to FINA, which is the international organization that runs the world championships, that runs the Olympics. So if you want to be a world champion, you have to go through FINA uh, to, to be part of that. Uh, we are endorsed by Swim Canada and Swim Ontario. Uh, Mirtha comes with a 25-year warranty on the tank. It's a green technology. It offers speed of construction. It's a world leader since 1961. So about 300 commercial tanks go in a year. And uh, every major event that you'll see, you'll see at least some of it will be Mirtha technology. Within 100 miles of you, uh, Mirtha Pools are Toronto Pan Am Centre, the Windsor International Aquatic Centre, Markham Pan Am Centre, and, and uh, several other smaller tanks as well. But those are the big competitive pools, which are really the biggest pools in Canada. And why is that as well? They're a little different. If you went swimming in a Mirtha pool, you wouldn't go, oh, this is a Mirtha pool, unless you really understood it. They are stainless steel. Uh, they are not concrete pools. They are uh, based off stainless steel construction. They're all modular. They're all built in Italy, transported and put together on site. So you predetermine the size. It's all engineered. It is 50 meter, meter pool built within two millimeters of perfect square every time, which is why FINA loves it because they know uh, when you when you hit the tense end screen on a competitive swimmer, uh, they're into thousands of a second now. So if the pool was half an inch out, that actually changes the dynamics of who finishes first and who finishes fourth. So that exact proportion is, a, is very important. It's all hard ponded PVC, no welded steel, rigid, excellent yield strength, very light, and so it's a very green product. If you know, um, have ever done anything on carbon footprint, concrete is extremely inefficient. And even though we have to use it in our buildings and our, our growth, obviously, uh, where we can reduce it, we always try. So Mirtha has way ahead on the, the market for this. Uh, it's 100% waterproof. We have them in high-rise buildings all over the world. I actually had a picture up and I took it back out at, uh, on a 60-story building. Uh, they have the Porsche Towers in uh, Florida. They're in Thailand. The three buildings stuck together through a, with a pool. Uh, 60, 60 stories up, uh, so you have to have waterproofing, UV, LG resistant, uh, just a proven product all the way through. So just so pictures always kind of tell the world, the world what's going on, this is Windsor International Aquatic Center. It is a 71 meter 10 lane pool. It is was host to the World Junior Championships back in uh, 13. And that's actually was the catalyst to have it built. It is now uh, functioning as a multi-purpose pool for the community, as well as a major event pool. So this this is really a pull to, to drive revenue to the community, and they've done been very successful with it. So Windsor International, probably the biggest indoor pool in Canada. Normally, you run with a 50-meter pool for the big international events. This one is even bigger, and they actually have a movable floor at one end where they can lift it up, and they use that as the uh, staging surface for when they have international meets. Toronto Pan Am, if you're in aquatics at all, you will have heard of TPASC or Toronto Pan Am Center. So this is where the uh, Pan Am Games happened uh, in Ontario a couple of years ago. And uh, it has actually two 50 meter tanks and a dive well. They use it all the time. It's so popular that they actually rent it to other countries now and other countries with competitive teams come into Toronto and train and compete. It is considered one of the nicest pools in the world currently. 
And this is the warm-up pool, has a double movable floor, it is 10 lanes, so this can run a meet as well. But in competition, you need to have a warm-up system, so they use this as the warm-up pool for larger meets. And this is all Mirtha technology. So the start blocks, it has a movable floor. It, uh, this is the part and parcel that is Mirtha. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. It's called the WFCU pool in Windsor. This was a six lane, 25 meter pool with a therapy pool. And it actually has, if you look at the far end, you'll see that it has a on deck splash pad. That was the choice of Windsor because of, of the other amenities. Uh, it is connected to the WFC arena, WFCU arena. This pool was put in, doors open, pool, change rooms, the whole piece was put in, installed, uh, just shy of eight minutes. It was uh, opened in 2016, and uh, obviously it was a Mirtha that was part of it. So it tells you what you can build without having to get crazy in pricing. It is a great pool. It's well-received. It was the warm-up pool for the World Championships in 2016. And actually the pool for the 2016, uh, they used the arena and built the pool inside that area on top of an arena pad, which was pretty fantastic. That pool that they use for the world championships is now in the midst of going into the Windsor University. So that will be uh, stay within the community, which is pretty cool. But uh, the WC- Can I just interrupt you there? Sure. Sorry, could you just repeat the length and the um, lanes on that one? Yeah, this is a 25 meter, six lane. So each lane is two and a half meters because it's uh, official length uh, width now. And it's 25 meters long. So standard short course. This is another pool which is, which is within 100 miles of you. It's in Innisfil. It's a 25 meter Mirtha and it has a therapy pool. This is the example that we use for communities when is to have a large therapy pool for seniors to learn to swim, those ideas. Uh, if you build it right, you can use that as your warm up pool if you wanna have competition. Uh, it has just so many multiple pieces of it. This is only a six lane and, and you know that it's by design and by what other amenities are in the city and the community and what they want, right? So it depends on what you want. Mirtha can build anything anywhere to any size. Once we have the pattern, we, we build it. And we are endorsed by Swim Canada. So uh, it is something that uh, as a competitive swim program, Mirtha is the desired program anywhere in the world. And uh, just so you know. So the second piece I just wanted to talk to you because we wanted to talk about green energy. I just want to throw some ideas into your head today. Just what does it feel like and what, what are the differences? When people build a pool, the, the number that people always go is how much, how much, how much. So the difference between putting in a horizontal sand filter, which is extremely inefficient, compared to putting something like this is tremendous. So that's the thinking out front. What I always say is you can pay me now or you can pay me forever. If you build an inefficient system with an inefficient heat system, uh, in a efficient filtration, inefficient pool, it's not going to give you the benefit you that you want. So this is another piece of that puzzle that can be reviewed. And as you get down the road, obviously, and we're not making decisions today, it just gives you an idea of what's out there for energy efficiency. This is called a Defender Filtration by Evoqua. Uh, I've used it for 20 years. Um, in your community, um, Great Wolf Lodge in Niagara has them, St. Catharines has them, Burlington has them, London has about 15 of these. Uh, Greater Toronto area has several, um, some private institutions, some public institution. So they're not new. What they are is overlooked by a lot of designers. And, and you have to kind of, that's why I always like to have the, the people in the community have some understanding. So they ask the questions. Whatever pool you build, do your homework get some information, ask the questions. Quite honestly, many designers put the same pool in they did the last time. And, and you have to think outside the box to move forward. So you, you have to do some homework, get some good information and bring it to the table uh, to have a discussion on it. So this is a defender filtration. 
It is uh, extremely uh, energy efficient, uh, both with water, heat, and chemical safety. There's uh, over 5,000 units in operation worldwide. It offers a 10-year warranty, and it's uh, a world leader. And this year at the World Aquatic Health Conference, which unfortunately was uh, remote, but it obviously gives the same benefit, it brings people together from about 25 different countries, and there's a couple uh, universities that are there engineering piece that they have a piece within the university that only does aquatics. Uh, Dr. James Ambergris is a world authority on filtration and he actually did a evaluation of the Defender filtration at the World Aquatic Health Conference this year. He has no money gains, any part or piece of that. He just takes things and evaluate and he was asked to do the Defender and great phenomenal response from him and the aquatics world in energy savings and it's uh it actually picks up such so it's such small microns it actually picks up crypto iridium about 98 percent of crypto so for those of you who may work in the aquatics world that's a big number these days dealing with crypto sporidium. and how do they do it it's not a one-day event it takes time so this is just a quick overview this is a customer i'm working with right now so this gives you an overview on money spent versus money saved so just to give a quick uh, the, the green line would be the cost of Defender over time. The blue line would be cost of normal filtration. So the payback analysis is tremendous. And uh, that's how it, it pays for itself. Besides the fact of doing the right thing, leads, points, all those parts of idea and pieces, it's doing the right thing in our communities. That's short and sweet. I am uh, really was hoping to get questions and concerns and uh, things that you may uh, want to discuss within the, your, your complex or you're looking forward. I did want to turn it over to Scott and give him lots of time to talk. So uh, I think I'll just let that go. And Scott Voki, I haven't heard you yet, but uh, if you want to take over the screen, I will let you go forward and then we can do a Q&A with the folks that are on the call if we want to do that at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, folks. Um, defer to the chair. Mr. Chair, do you want to take questions now or would you like to go into a second presentation? Well, uh, we don't have an official. Sorry, I just punched mute again. We don't have an official RFAB meeting quorum. Uh, well, with, with Ian joining us, we do. However, I, I've already canceled the meeting. However, I would still uh, really like you to uh, give your presentation and uh, we'll entertain any uh, questions at the end. How's that sound? OK, sounds great. I will attempt to um, share now that uh, Scott's closed his. So while Scott loads that up, I'll just uh, tell you my relationship. Uh, I worked with Emoresco for about six years. We did projects within the City of London, and Emoresco continues with the City of London building more efficient facilities. That's really what they do. Uh, and then I've worked with Emoresco on other projects within Ontario. Uh, working on reducing the carbon footprint or reducing the energy load on a building or a facility. So that's how I know Emoresco. I don't work for them, et cetera. We have a, a working relationship only. So that's that's how I know Scott and Emoresco. But we've uh, talked on several projects over the last several years, and uh, it's been very, very positive. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Voki. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, so, my name is Scott Foki. Um, I work at Amoresco, as Scott said. My um, bulk of my career was in the municipal sector, where I worked for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. But two years ago, joined Amoresco largely because I'm motivated by reducing Canada's carbon, and it became very clear to me that the public sector uh, does not have the capacity both staff or financial to do it on its own. And it needs to basically leverage private sector expertise and private sector funding, which is one of the reasons why I think um, Amresco has uh, a lot to offer. So 
today I want to do a, a very high level overview of the company itself very, very quickly. Um, talk about what we do to help buildings decarbonize, both existing, but uh, more importantly for this group, uh, new buildings. And then talk about a uh, type of financing that's called energy as a service, which helps uh, enable this achievement of net zero. So Amoresco um, is a publicly traded company on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. Um, in Canada, we've been around much longer than 2000. We were a separate engineering firm that was purchased by Amoresco uh, as part of their growth into uh, both Canada and the UK. Currently, we have um, just over a thousand employees in those three countries. Um, about 110, I believe, here in Canada from, from coast to coast to coast. And we do a lot of work in the public sector. Our main client in Canada, for example, is the federal government, uh, where we do uh, primarily retrofits, not so much new builds, but retrofits of um, buildings, bureaucratic buildings in Ottawa, Armed Forces bases in the Maritimes, and we're actually doing a really interesting project in Alert, uh, very far up north. So, um, chose two facilities that are in the municipal sector here in Ontario and the education sector, uh, not far from Norfolk County. And one is a retrofit and one is a new build, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, a net zero facility. And Scott uh, mentioned net zero uh, briefly. One of the reasons we're really bullish on net zero is if you're going to build a new building and you're going to operate own and operate that building for the length of its uh, life cycle, anywhere from 40 to, to 50 to perhaps even longer in terms of uh, time you'll have that building. The um, carbon generated from that building could be substantial if it is not a net zero facility. And perhaps um, another reason to consider is competitiveness. So my understanding is that Norfolk County pursued IKIP funding uh, for the rec center that it was looking to build. Uh, IKIP was very, very competitive. I think pretty much every community in Ontario applied for IKIP, um, and there was only so much money to go around. Net zero is one of those differentiators now. And just today, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, awarded $11 million in funding to two communities in British Columbia building police detachments and, and both were net zero. So I think this is going to be um, where those funding agencies start to look more and more and will actually almost become um, a mandatory consideration in the future if you are seeking senior levels of government funding. So we'll start with the retrofit. This is um, an optic of the John Paul II Secondary School um, in London. It's a London District School Catholic Board, London District Catholic School Board. Pardon me. Um, fairly old facility needed some structural work. Um, we were able to um, get funding from Natural Resources Canada, as well as bring some of our own equity to the table. And what we're doing is pulling that building off of natural gas, so removing the fossil fuels, putting uh, air source heat pumps in the building, which have already uh, been installed. There is solar, and this particular rendition, um, we initially thought we would do solar on the roof. The roof could not support that structure, so we actually ended up putting more solar than initially designed uh, in terms of carports and carports in the parking lots that are integrated with uh, EV charging stations. So four of those carports are going to have uh, vehicle charging stations, and there will be another one that's in construction right now for a school bus charging station as well. Below the uh, surface of the uh, fields in front of the school are uh, a geothermal system. So this is a, a vertical drill 
um, which is also complete and has been uh, re-landscaped. And that provides the heat exchange for that new air source heat pumps and, and helps the facility get off of the natural gas. And in addition to that, there is a battery energy storage system. So essentially um, the same type of technology that's in electric vehicles, just a much larger scale. And that allows this facility to be um, resilient. So if the power goes out, uh, the facility can power itself for a um, certain amount of time and can also take advantage of the surplus generation on a nice sunny day when the solar panels are producing more energy than the school needs, can recharge those batteries and they can use it uh, at a later time. Here's a picture of one of those carports and talking about some of the objectives of this particular facility. And the primary objective was to demonstrate um, that carbon-free or net zero facility could be built uh, as a retrofit. To date, um, most net zero facilities have been built as new build, and it certainly is cheaper to do that than a retrofit because you can take advantage of synergies in the design process as well as you don't have to um, do reconstruction, the costs involved with that. But with a little bit of federal funding, this facility uh, proves the concept and interestingly is coming in under budget because of certain cost reductions, um, solar panels being one of them. The, the price drops in solar over the last 15 years has been uh, quite astounding. Here is a new build, and this is an interesting new build that we actually came into this project fairly late. Um, this is the community of Middlesex Center. They were building a new fire hall in uh, Colt, and um, through some ex existing contacts we have with that community, they said, um, you know, Amoresco, we've got this facility primarily 75% designed. Uh, we're looking um see if we could take it one step further and make this a net zero facility can you help us so we worked with uh, the architect to the construction firm and with um, some tweaks and made that facility net zero and went to natural resources canada and the federation of Canadian municipalities and achieved some um some grants which ended up um, achieving a net zero facility results for the same cost as uh, a run of the mill um, fire hall. They're uh, very pleased with, with the results. Um, and you can go to their uh, council website a couple months ago. Um, they had a report about how it's performing and it's actually overperforming. And the occupants of the fire hall are also quite happy with the performance of that facility. So in terms of kind of the net zero process, um, some of the things we like to look at or are looking at the base case, um, sitting down as a team and deciding which uh, key performance indicators we want to track. Uh, if it's a retrofit, then we start to implement energy efficiency measures. If it's a new build, then you want to sit down with the architects and the construction firm and make sure that those are incorporated. Uh, and continue to sit at the table so that they're not value engineered out of the equation uh, as you get closer to construction. Um, and then you see kind of the range of uh, type of technologies that, that help achieve that net zero facility. So monitoring um, geothermal, depending on the location, it could be solar more commonly, uh, less commonly uh, biomass or wind. Um, preferably, you can uh, um, include a battery energy storage system, and then there is a control system and uh, measuring and verification to basically verify the success of those measures and to also enable the operators of the facility to continue to operate that building uh, to its maximum potential. One of the things we're including more and more in our retrofits and, and designs are, are pandemic sensitive solutions. So 
essentially the same list of energy conservation measures that have uh, touchless controls and sensors and with some additional air filtration and monitoring as well. And there are a number of certifications. Uh, most of you have probably heard of LEED in terms of new build, but in terms of the health of buildings, um, also certifications such as the well and the healthy building um, certifications that look at the air exchange and the airflow and the air purification um, of those systems as well. So turning to new builds, um, Amresco has made our bread and butter in retrofits, but we see more and more uh, demand for new builds. And we have a net zero new build solution that we're looking to uh, get off the ground here in Ontario. And as part of that solution, it's essentially the level of involvement that any client would want us to do. So we can do a design, build, finance, operate, maintain model, um, and sitting now with the client and its, its uh, other partners, basically divvy up who does what. Um, our interest is in the energy and the performance and the sustainability side, but we certainly do have um, construction management ca capabilities and we partner with folks on the design piece. Um, and we are able to project manage the whole package as well, if that's of interest to a particular client. But again, the primary objective is to maximize the efficiency of the building and hopefully arrive at a net zero, zero carbon facility. One of the mechanisms that allows this to happen is uh, energy as a service. So similar kind of concept as software as a service. So you don't actually buy the asset, but you have a subscription to the asset. So in this particular instance, uh, it's a little bit different than an energy performance contract, and it's not quite a P3 either because the ownership of the building itself rests with uh, the municipality. That doesn't change. What does change is, is generally the ownership of the energy assets. So in this particular instance, if we were to build, let's say, a solar system, that was connected to a battery and a microgrid that was outside of a pool, MRESC would probably own that asset. And let's say for Norfolk County, would pay a subscription for the services in terms of the solar and the energy generated, but it would continue to own uh, and operate um, the pool and the interior uh, equipment within that pool or that multi-rec facility. So a little bit different in terms of the involvement of the client and getting financing um, in this energy as a service model, Amresco uh, fulfills that responsibility. We usually put in a little bit of our own equity as well. Um, we work with a number of financial institutions to, along, to arrange long-term financing and one of the, I think, positive developments recently that we're seeing from the federal government as well as the Canada Infrastructure Bank and Infrastructure Ontario is all of those agencies are interested in supporting this work and in providing uh, long-term financing at uh, incredibly low, historically low rates, actually. So I, I won't I won't bore you with this discussion of funding versus financing. I'm sure you're all um, quite a, aware of that, but uh, we don't necessarily bring funding to the table. Uh, we do bring financing. We often uh, work with clients to apply for funding from FCM or Natural Resources Canada, um, but we don't actually provide any of our own funding. Some of the financing sources um, in terms of debt and equity are listed here in this slide. In Canada, we, in terms of the uh, debt providers, uh, we work with um, some of the big five banks, some of the major life insurance companies, and we also work with the, um, 
the Van City Credit Union uh, out west, as it is a uh, big supporter of green energy and clean energy projects. One of the, the benefits I don't think I've covered uh, to date in terms of energy as a service is uh, their maintenance um, of the equipment, as well as the technology risk uh, stays with Amoresco in this instance, which provides uh, clients with peace of mind and the ability to focus on their uh, key services. So uh, for focusing on a pool, uh, you may have recreation staff that are very well trained in uh, turbidity and all of the uh, parameters and KPIs related to, to water treatment and dehumidification inside the facility, but they may not uh, know much about um, renewable energy or renewable energy systems, and you may want to have a third party uh, take on that responsibility for the life of the agreement, uh, which is one of the things that Amoresco is able to do. So that is a whirlwind tour. Um, I don't know if I provided too much detail or not enough detail. I'm coming to this a little bit late, so, so um, I apologize for that. But I uh, thank you for your time and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Scott V and Scott V. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you guys uh, putting together uh, the slide decks and uh, talking to us today. I know we've got uh, a lot of questions uh, kind of formulating in our heads. I welcome uh, anybody to ask any questions uh, at this time and uh, we'll, uh, we'll also uh, be able to engage uh, through Scott Bowron uh, uh, in the future for sure. So any questions? Uh, Sue, uh, you, you asked online, uh, how much for the Innisfil complex? Scott? You're not oh, you're muted. muted. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm just slow at typing. So uh, Innisfil was built as part of a larger project. So it was built as a complete community center. So the standalone complex, uh, I don't have the numbers for today. I can try to get some and it's been built for a while, so I can uh, see about that. But quite frankly, each pool is going to be a little bit unique in its build. Uh, depending on what you want, all the features, it's like buying a car. Do you buy an a SE or do you buy a XLE, right? What, what do you want, the parts and pieces, the basic box? We can certainly price out, but uh, even when you, we looked at WFCU, uh, just the amount of window space and those kind of ideas a lot of times when people build facilities, they get lost in all the decorations, I'll just call it. And, and not, not that it's wrong, just, I, I don't know about you, but I don't go swimming to look at wood on the ceiling. I go to swim to look at a, to go to a facility that's obviously really nice, but I just sometimes I wonder why we spend the money where we spend it. I was at a five lane, 25 meter pool uh, recent, well, in the last six months. And uh, so I said, what, what happened to the rest of your pool? Right, because it's in a large community. They said, we, we didn't have enough money to, to put the lanes. We had to cut a lane to pay for the comp. The, we just ran out of money at the end. Like, like Scott Vokey said, uh, you get near the end of your project and some of the times the, the meat and potatoes gets lost. And uh, so the whole top of his building is covered in wood plank. Unbelievable amount of wood and extra stuff, right? That's an architectural dream, but not really functional. And uh, so they lost the lane of their pool for that. So I've, I've just, you know, just, just got to think hard about what you want. What what is your what is your objective here? If you want a you know a, a twenty five meter rec pool, if you want a fifty meter competitive pool, that the vessel is that's the cell, right? That's that's your marketing tool or your tool that you're going to use. Everything else is extra. If you need seating or if you need a, a warm up pool, if you need a therapy pool, which I highly recommend. You know, these days putting in a a dive well for people my age that it. They always go, well, you have to have a dive well. That's because we grew up with diving. 
unless you have diving, unless you have a big dive team, dive dive pool, dive uh, diving boards and diving is really a big risk. So, and where's the value of it? The amount of footprint you need to run a diving program, the depth you need in the pool to run a diving program, all those parts and pieces are all, all are all things to think about. So, so what I'm saying is that to answer your question in a long form, I guess is uh, each pool will be will be have a, its own price point, so to speak. So uh, that pool, I, I would tell you right off the top of my head, it's probably a ten million dollar pool for for the change rooms, the whole piece. But it was tied to another facility. Uh, I've seen the same pool in Ontario for $22 million and the WCU was went in for about eight. So, and if, if you went to WC, at WFCU in Windsor, you would be very happy as a swimmer there and as a participant, they love it. So it's both ends of the spectrum. Thanks Scott. Uh, I see Amy's got her hand up, but she just uh, stepped away for a second. Okay. Um, oh, she's back. Are you ready to ask your question there, Amy, or? Uh... I had to get my charger. If someone else has one, they can go ahead. Otherwise, I can be ready. Well, uh, I'm ready. Oh, oh, go ahead then, Amy. OK. Um, so Scott B, uh, I'm wondering if you can maybe put on your former hat and I can ask you a broad sure. question in your um, so, you know, London is not comparable to Norfolk County, but certainly some of the surrounding communities would be um, are, in your in your previous work or even just dealing with pools. Have you encountered any um, communities that are struggling through their rural nature with competing competitive amenities and and how they centralize those and. Um, you know, as an example here in Norfolk County, we could be looking at one end of a community losing something and um, but really we'd be able to pool our resources together and have a phenomenal bigger pool that can host more and do those competitions and things like that. Do you have uh, any experience with working with rural communities when building or project managing? Well, probably both. In, inside the city of London, uh, I was involved in the, what's the, are you familiar with London? What's now the East End project just went in. So London used to only have three indoor pools and uh, we've developed three new ones in the last five years. Uh, it's very behind for a city of half a million people. And uh, so the process when we went to build the new pool in East London met with a lot of pushback from the community, from the East End community, where, where it was sitting, where it was going to sit. And uh, it was almost anarchy in the meetings, quite frankly. <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. We want this, we don't want it here. I want it close to me, but I don't want it too close to me. And I don't want to have to drive, but I don't want it too close to me. And, uh, you know, that whole, and there was huge huge turnout which if you've done community meetings sometimes you have four people who are really interested and the rest just sit home and talk about it this one garnered a lot of response uh in the end there was uh both where the pool was located and all the, and the other amenities uh there was a little bit of a give and take from council in the end to make everybody as happy as they could be but there's never going to be a winner here it's making everybody understand that for the big Big picture, everybody's going to win. Uh, I know some communities have struggled exactly what you what you asked, Amy. Where, particularly when uh, through amalgamation, et cetera, where you'll have two hubs of of population, and there might be ten thousand people here and ten thousand people there, which I think is what you folks are dealing with. <laughs> so, how come people A get it and people B don't? It, it's got to be launched somewhere. You know, where is the property? Where does it make sense? Where's the access? access? Uh, why is it going to be in that facility? And making people have a little bit of understanding. I think bringing them in and letting them understand why, why those decisions are made. Ultimately, I think uh, that, your, that your city folks who are really the experts, and hopefully you have expert input, and bring your folks who are involved in the city currently, uh, operations, maintenance, and management that uh, bring them forward. And then the location is really logistics, right? Where does it make sense and why? If you're going to have 
are, are just a community pool where you're not looking outside the borders, then, uh, you know, location isn't as important if you, I mean, as far as centrally, but if you are looking anywhere beyond that, where is it location where people can get to and, and really truly enjoy it? And uh, yeah, it's a struggle. It's never easy. It's amazing how, how into projects the community can get. And many of them will never step into the community, but they're upset anyways. It's and like I'm, the New Year's resolution where you think you're going to start to exercise in the New Year. So you might use it and you might go to it. But if you're not necessarily, a, you know, a part of those amenities, maybe you won't. But we do have a lot of uh, other other amenities and there's a lot of what am I going to gain? What am I going to lose happening? Sure. And we need to kind of switch our dialogue to what's the community going to gain when we can do it bigger and better and more efficiently. Right. Um, yeah. Recreation is it's a. It's a tough one because it's it's always seems like secondary. People go, well, we need new roads or you know build bigger sewers. Well, that's wonderful, but that does not bring you to a city. That does not make for a healthy community. Recreation does, and uh, people really want it. As a you know, we're in, we live in Canada. The second part is a, when you're talking to them is is the health, right? It's Thunder Bay has a 50 meter pool. And it's an older pool, and they've actually taken part of the deck space, cordoned it off, and now when their seniors do their rec program in the morning, they actually have a tea after. They set up a tea system after, and they've cordoned it off so it meets public health. When I went there and I'm standing uh, on the edge of the deck, to me, that's the epitome of community. They have the seniors over there. There's a learn to swim program here. There's They actually uh, brought their a gym on the. A, uh, elevated space like just the whole plate it's humming it, it means community and that's uh that's some good thinking on the part of the folks in thunder bay to how do we how do we not only bring them to the pool but how do we keep them there so that they feel part of it and then they tell their friends you know what i meet for tea at 9 30 after uh after we do huff and puff swim and away we go and there was like 50 people sitting there wow it was awesome. So that's just one example, right? There's, there's what you have to think about it. How do we get these people here and how do we keep them here so they feel part of the community? People will drive 15 or 20 minutes for that. I'll drive 15 minutes to get a coffee because I like it. If you like something, you'll go for it. Right. Um, my next question for you is um, outdoor pools. Have you done any refurbishments on outdoor facilities? Yeah, so uh, it just opened this year kind of oh, semi-opened, I guess, uh, Dorchester Pool okay. is actually a run of action by, by Mirtha. And the Exeter Pool is a refurbishment by Mirtha. And I'm happy to send you pictures or whatever if you wanted to have a peek at that. They're awesome. They're really the 50-year-old facilities that are, um, you know, we have a real problem in Canada. The first Trudeau was big on sport. There's pictures of him, you know, kind of a buff guy. And it was our centennial. They spent a lot of money on recreation. Now we have all these 50-year-old facilities. You can't close them, and nobody has the money to refurbish them. So how do we do that? So Mirtha has a what's called a renov action, where you take the existing facility and you re renovate it in place, so on the same footprint. I would be interested in some of those if you if you could sure. send some sure. visuals or links. Yeah. That would be great. Um, okay, and then um, Scott. Uh, the other Scott, my my, I do have one question for you on the funding model and and the subscription rate with the municipality. How is that determined, and what factors come into that? Essentially, the equipment that's put in. Um, so we have done everything from just um, uh, five hundred kilowatt solar system on its own, where the client pays for the solar energy generated to um, a fairly complex microgrid system where the clients actually finance the construction of some of the building as well. And there is a obviously more expensive and longer term subscription fee for that because you're def you're moving some of the, ask the core assets over into the uh, energy as a service contract. Thanks, Paul. 
Scott Volke, uh, I, I was interested to uh, ask a question about that energy as a service uh, concept. Uh, does the uh, does the energy uh, need to come from the same site in order to be uh, eligible for uh, these kind of contracts? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright as an architect uh, may not want falling water to uh, have solar panels scattered across the top. Um, so there was a field a mile away. Would it uh, would it still kind of fall under this energy as a service model if uh, you put up the solar panels in another area? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I think Frank Lloyd Wright would have hated solar panels. Um, the, my answer is a definitive maybe. And because these things are governed by uh, provincial uh, regulation, and the province actually just floated a discussion paper from the Ontario Energy Board allowing for the possible development of what's called community uh, generation. So um, Amoresco, our headquarters uh, corporately is in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, we've been developing exactly what you spoke about for years. So communities there, for example, have abandoned landfills, um, sites that they have to maintain and monitor the gas of, but otherwise um, completely unusable. So many, many communities there put up solar fields there and then use that power that's generated for other facilities that they own within the uh, capital C community. We hope Ontario goes in that direction. It looks like they will. Um, so all I can say is um, stay tuned. Okay, uh, that's uh, that, that's interesting. As a uh, follow-up, uh, have you had any communities approach you to try and make the entire uh, community uh, infrastructure uh, or is it uh, still kind of centralized in one specific building or one uh, area of service within that community? Hmm. It tends to be at least um, campus focused. I, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any, any energy company that's on a whole community wide approach. Usually communities kind of break up um, quadrants or projects or chunks and procure separately. Uh, we have done in the United States again um, with a couple of large university campuses, fairly large footprints in terms of the geography of the community uh, on multiple buildings and multiple sites, including um, solar fields off a facility. Um, but I don't have a good example to point you towards in Canada where we've done that on a whole community basis yet. I guess uh, my, my question, uh, uh, like uh, just dreaming in terms of Norfolk County in general, if uh, if Norfolk County could advertise itself as a net zero uh, county, um, you know, that that's what I was uh, getting at there, I mm. was uh, just trying to say, okay, if we had uh, green fields uh, that, that we could cover with solar panels out in the the, the abandoned uh, areas or in uh, areas that we want to rehabilitate um you know would that uh, would would that be eligible for consideration if we were going to build an urban uh, an urban swimming pool say or something like that um, one of the other things i was thinking of was if uh if a building's lifespan is 50 to 70 years um how how does the the addition of uh, all the solar on that affect the, uh, the, the lifespan of the, the building and is the uh, solar infrastructure going to age out twice as fast as a building or three times as fast as a building or are they quite equivalent in, uh, in the, the cost or sorry, the, the time of replacement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. Okay, so in terms of the first question, uh, absolutely. Uh, love to see Norfolk County take that leadership. There are some communities that are developing or have developed what they call uh, corporate energy plans. City of Vancouver, um, Halifax comes to mind, um, City of Toronto, 
And in those plans, there is usually a time frame to achieve net zero. Um, some of them link up with the federal target of 2050. Um, there's a small community that's probably more comparative to Norfolk, um, town of New Glasgow, that we're actually doing some work with in Nova Scotia, only 10,000 people. And they have a net zero target of 2030, uh, which is fantastic to see um, that kind of leadership. So in terms of the second question, um, if you were to do a new build, let's say that had a lifespan of 50 years, most likely the solar panels would be replaced um, once, perhaps even twice during that lifespan. Um, all energy equipment degrades in terms of its efficiency. Um, solar panels have a degradation curve, just like LED lights have a degradation curve, just as natural gas boilers have a degradation curve. Uh, those curves are tending to get longer as the technology improves. Um, but on the flip side, the efficiency of the panels is also increasing. So most likely within probably the 12 to 15 year period after you've installed a solar system, whoever owns and operates that, whether it's with you or us or someone else, would run the analysis of what the cost would be and the efficiency gain of putting new panels on the system. Quite likely, if it's a roof-based system or if it's a uh, carport system, you could use most of the supportive infrastructure, AKA the racks, um, with a little bit of maintenance, but you would probably replace the panels within the 15 to 20 year time period. Okay. Um, but before I turn the floor over to, uh, to Gordon Ian for uh, any questions, I have one final question uh, regarding the energy as a service. Uh, uh, what is the uh, comparative cost premium per kilowatt hour to use energy as a service versus uh, just pulling it off the off the grid. Yeah, it's a multiplier. So if you're doing um, depends what rates you're doing, if it's an all in, let's say 11 cents a kilowatt in Ontario, which is a number that's used a lot. Um, if it's a solar number, it's probably going to be uh, delivered close to double that. If it's um, another type of technology, let's say biomass, uh, could be more, could be less, depending on the feedstock. And if it's something experimental, let's say uh, renewable natural gas or, or hydrogen, it's going to be uh, considerably more. So it really does depend upon both the technology and the scale. The larger the systems, the, um, the lower the per kilowatt hour fee as well. Okay, thanks. Ian, uh, any questions? Yes, hello, thank you for calling upon me. Uh, I guess it's just, it's just Paul if we're not in a meeting, eh? Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, so it's, all, it's always Jerry, just Paul. Jerry Anderson. Um, right on. Um, honestly, um, I was thinking about something the other day when I was getting into some reports about spontaneous play and having an ability to go to a community center and just pick something up or um, to jump in the pool in this instance, go to the splash pad. And I think that a lot of designs need to take spontaneous play into consideration. Um, Cause I almost feel like some of these amenities have become almost bureaucratic to book the space or to go to. And um, as Scott B was saying earlier, creating a space for people and getting them to stay um, is is one step in getting them into the pool and getting them active and maybe having them participate in something that's organized. But I think it's important uh, to offer amenities in, in a community where people have an option that's welcoming, where they feel they can just, there's drop-in times or it's not so bureaucratic. I got a call a person and book a time and commit to a thing and get a ticket. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of the images that were shared with us, um, I, I feel like some of those design elements were present. Um, I'm, I'm really in favor of uh, a therapy pool, a warm up pool, or just having a few 
really making adva taking advantage of the space and having a few amenities for different ages and abilities. And I think that's important in, in building a community center. So I guess a question after I provided that sort of context, maybe back to Scott B, if he could expand on that or um, if our other Scott, I don't S, here we, or sorry, <laughs> Mr. Volke. Um, you know, I don't know what your experiences are with uh, design elements and creating space for, for spontaneous play or maybe what your experiences are working with municipalities that maybe tend to be a little bit more uh, overly um, formal or bureaucratic in the use of their space. Sure. Uh, glad to share that. The generally pools are, are you plan it and you have a schedule. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is staffing and uh, it's big, but I, if I take what you're saying, sort of like pick up hockey, that idea, how simple is that? Oh, I can go today or I'm not going today because I have that. Where if you have a hockey team, that with kids, getting them out and getting them active, uh, you know, and providing that space. What I would say to you, Ian, is that's having a facility that's able to accommodate that where you can do uh, several things. So if you had a larger pool, you could have an open space, free swim, and you can have a swim team. Uh, on larger complexes now, we're actually, uh, I don't know if you'd be familiar with a bulkhead, what a bulkhead is in a large pool. That's the movable piece, right, that you'll have in a, let's say, 50 meter pool. We actually do split bulkheads now. So you can actually do 50 meter swim, which is swim team, 25 meter learn to swim, 25 meter open space or whatever you wanted. That kind of thinking is, is the, how you would accomplish that in, and just have it by space. The, the, the struggle with it from just off the top of my head would be, would be scheduling staff and, and that kind of thing. You know, there's a cost and benefit and, you know, if you can fill the pool, how do you fill the pool? And, and we always want to make sure there's people, but, uh, you know, as a community, we want to, we want to make sure that it's open and available with the seniors programs. The more you have that are kind of, I'm going to say drop in. It's, it's crazy how many seniors will use your facility now, particularly if you have a, a warm up. A, so a therapy pool generally runs around 30, 92 degrees, not a hot tub. So I would, and you'll hear this through, if you decide to put a pool in and you have a public meeting, you'll say, I need a hot tub and I need a diving well. Well, hot tubs are nothing but a problem for operations. They're expensive. Uh, they're limited because you can't put young people in. You can only put old pe older people in them. Sorry, not old people, older people in them. A therapy pool, your one-year-old can jump in there and learn to swim in a very, very comfortable environment. And when they're not in there, the 55 or 70-year-olds can be in there, and they're very comfortable. A hot tub, you're not supposed to be in for more than 15 minutes. So a therapy pool, you can sit in for three hours if you wish. That kind of idea. So thinking about what you put in, how you put it in, where you put it in, in, in relationship. And, you know, if you build a nice big uh, facility away you go and it's your warm-up pool as well uh, <clears throat> the the pool i showed you in wcu the 25 meter they put in a smaller therapy pool but put in an on deck uh splash pad i varied thoughts on that uh i i think you would get more benefit out of the therapy pool over the long term but it, it's certainly very cool looking and when there's a learn to swim program in you have a therapy or a splash pad area for for the little ones and it brings little people into the facility to play right or if their brother or sister are are taking a swimming lessons they they have a place to to hang out and they're part of that culture early uh so that's that's where you, you know you have to kind of make those decisions as you build and i think that's what you're kind of asking how do you do that how big a footprint do you want to make and how big an action you know can you make so we are all limited by cash, but uh, certainly thinking about the holistic community is is part of that that thinking. I guess the only other uh, that was, that was a softball and answered it well. Thank <laughs> you for that context. I guess like the the harder question I need to ask is with with regards to COVID nineteen. I realize there will be a vac vaccination one day. We will get back to a new normal, but the world's forever changed. You know, how do you incorporate being six feet apart? Um, you know, the, the new design of change rooms where 
headed towards a future where we'll be more barrier free. AODA is going to be uh, the new religion in 2025 across the board. And, you know, we're looking at creating a more accessible barrier free design for all of our buildings. But now we've had this global pandemic where we're six feet apart. We're doing contract tracing for everyone that walks through the front door. It's not so easy to drop in uh, to a community amenity anymore. Right. Um, and so there's all these new. Um, I think it's really going to change our social fabric in a way where we've become a lot more conscious about our hygiene and about how we interact with others. And so for building a community asset such as a pool, um, it's, it's early on. We haven't even had our one year anniversary of this virus, but you know, what can you tell me that you've learned on um, the six months, eight months you've been at it? <laughs> Good question. Wow. That is the hardball. So I, I don't think we have a, I don't think we know where exactly we're going. I think Scott showed you a picture, Scott Vokey showed you a picture of sort of a, the new look in facilities, a little bit wider, a little bit bigger corridors, all that. We are going to be nervous of being around our fellow man for a long time, I believe. I think what you'll see uh, is probably there'll be some sort of a, I can tell you that um, just outside of London, there's a factory when people walk in, they go into a machine already and get tested and touch. Have you done this? That's, that's what progressive companies are doing because they can't afford to shut down and they can't afford to have COVID and come into the plant. I think you'll see that in our amenities. And once it becomes more uh, comfortable for people, much like a sci-fi movie, which is now normal. Uh, you'll walk in, you'll, you'll, ha you'll, you'll have a machine that tests your temperature, et cetera. And I th probably in the East, and I mean talking Asia, they're probably already doing that as a norm as well. Getting onto a train, getting onto a plane, getting on into facilities. I think that's where you're going to see it is at the doorway. Once you're in, people, you, you're swimming. Currently, we're running swimming programs, and it's six feet apart. They've managed to... Uh, Amy, are you in the aquatics, your aquatic venue now? Is that your portfolio? Okay. So uh, I don't know if anybody on the call today is actually in, involved in aquatics and, and for Norfolk, but uh, adjusting to that, the, the, the trouble will be, you're, you hit it, is from the parking lot to the pool. How do we get there in the safe manner without having to touch people? And, uh, you know, it will be the way the change rooms are set up, the in out, which we all, I, quite honestly, most of this is how we should have been doing things current uh, already. We're just much more aware of it. It's like cleaning, you know. Your custodian is now a superhero, and that always should have been that way, and we wouldn't have some of the issues we have. But uh, I think it will be more in the entry and exit to the change rooms that you'll see change, and I think the programming piece what we do know is that COVID doesn't transfer in water. Right? It's extremely weak in its uh, as a microbiology. So once you're in the water, unless you uh, aer aerosol, really it's not an issue. And we do know that, and I read directly from the CDC. So um, that's not going to be the issue in the contact point, although people as human beings will always have that nervousness. Uh, which is unfortunate, uh, you know, but listening to science and if we go with science, we, we know some things about it and some things, you know, we're, the, the problem is the aerosol piece. So it will be getting in and out. Yeah, and if I could just add to, to what Scott said, Ian, I think um, you kind of hit you kind of hit the nail on the head when you talked about designing. Um, I would really encourage anyone thinking about a new build to start with universal design principles as first principle. Um, so you know, if you haven't come across that terminology, universal design is essentially designing for people uh, in a wheelchair. So you have touches, controls, wider entranceways, uh, those types of things, because as, as our population ages, uh, we're, we're headed for more and more demand of that particular type of design anyway. So do it now and avoid having to retrofit a facility down the road for that um, inevitability. 
a couple of new things that we're, that we're seeing at Amoresco in terms of um, COVID, and not just COVID, but I think any kind of uh, pandemic or future pandemic, is uh, much more attention to indoor air quality. So I don't know if you ever watched the uh, weather network or you have people that have seasonal allergies or are asthmatic, but they, uh, they look at the air quality index uh, before going to a particular neighborhood or community. I think your facilities are going to have neighborhoods with AQI indicators. So you're probably going to see facilities at some point down the future which have a monitor which say the indoor air quality in this room is X, Y, and Z in terms of different parameters. The air is exchanged every, um, um, every so often and you'll have um, essentially monitors of the air, fresh air exchange as well as the air quality itself. There's a company that I came across in my travels in Denmark right now that are selling what looks like a little tiny bird, a plastic bird, uh, which uh, young parents are buying for their um, nurseries. And it's essentially an air quality monitor, which is about the size of a desktop lamp. So you can imagine the equivalent of that on an industrial scale in facilities um, such as pools and rec centers will be more and more common. So yeah, uh, Scott. Uh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. When, when schools were here opening, one of the big concerns was the air quality because we tend to do that. And when I met, started discussing, was what always should have been will be now. And uh, I've been in facilities where HVAC systems have not worked for ten years, and they, well, we can't afford to fix them. Well, you can't afford to not fix that, and now it will be pushed harder. Right. So what are you doing to the people coming in your facility if you don't have your equipment running? Right. Sort of thing. And that's what that, that's the situation we've had for a number of years at the, our current aquatics facility. Uh, um, you know, we've we, we've had a lot of air quality issues. I wondered, you know, we've talked a little bit about the pool design and uh, we, we just touched on the building and uh, healthy, healthy building designs. What uh, what kind of technology? Is there for uh, the air quality? Are we just going to be exchanging a lot, or is there uh, anything that draws the chemical uh, smell off of it faster, or uh, makes it a cleaner, healthier environment right. out there? So it starts really with the pool water. Pool air quality comes from pool water quality. The second part of that is HVAC, because HVAC under uh, ASHRAE, if, if you're familiar with ASHRAE, they set the standard for how much air exchange you have. So in a pool right now, you have to six to eight air exchanges. If you're in a high performance pool and you brought 2000 people and you would go to 100% turnover where 100% air comes in and 100% air leaves, well, that's extremely expensive to operate. So you don't do that all the time. So in the normal circumstances, six to eight turnovers of air. So if you have good water chemistry, your air quality will be much better. So that is a couple of things, having good equipment that can actually read, having, so now we can integrate the filter with the UV, with the uh, pool controller. That's the operators being trained to truly understand what they're doing, which is a, quite frankly, a big problem in our whole world. Uh, how much chemicals we use, how much chlorine we use. So we work at something, I told you I do advanced chemistry. So just to give you a quick, I don't, I don't want to get into this because I can talk about it for days, but if you went swimming in Europe, you would be swimming in the same amount of chlorine as in our, that is in our drinking water. In North America, we have a more chlorine is better philosophy. So uh, the chlorine residual in our drinking water in Ontario is 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per liter. That's that's what the uh, about how much chlorine they put in a swimming pool in most of Europe. In Ontario, if you had a spray pad, you have to have at least five parts per million of chlorine to open it, which in the U.S. is considered toxic. So we have some real issues here, and it all starts with understanding the water chemistry and how you operate. So it starts basically in the basement. 
which is always the part that get loses. You know, it's like buying you you build a beautiful Maserati pool, and then you put a Kia Rio engine in it and expect the operator to go 150 miles an hour. Well, it, it can't happen, right? So the operator's struggling the entire life of the pool at something you can't see. So you have to have good equipment under the engine in order to operate it correctly. And then the staff have to know how to drive it right, those ideas. But there's lots of good stuff and lots of integration. Now we use a variable drive systems to, to optimize that air quality to both the HVAC system and in deck. So, or under the deck in the filter room. So it really starts with there and then understanding the HVAC and you know, building automation systems make it more efficient or they can turn it up and turn it down as, as a ability allies, putting sensors in that can read, all those things, Paul, that you know, with technology there, it just have to put it into the systems. Well, you, you, uh, you, you touched on a, a keyword that uh, had me segueing off to my final question uh, right now anyway. Uh, staff technology, what's out there now to change the operating and maintenance cost in terms of reducing uh, the annualized cost of staffing these facilities? Okay, for, first of all, you're not going to get rid of staff. You're going to have them, uh, you can have them so that their entire system works off your phone. Uh, before I left the city of London, we were putting all of our pools so that the staff could read them right off their phone. So what's wrong, what's going on, if they had an alarm, you know, that's saving staff time, saving, you know, where, which issue do I deal with today? How efficient is my system running where they could turn things up and turn things down? So you, you can, that's all available and that's all basically almost standard. What happens is they put in all this equipment in many facilities and then say, well, the staff can't, they don't have access to that. Why? Well, they're not trained. We don't trust them. We don't, you know, you have to have, it's, again, uh, you have to teach somebody to drive to put them on a highway. So you have to give them the, that means and understanding. Uh, I, I can tell you I've done some energy projects with, within my old job. And uh, once staff have a true understanding, it's amazing what they can do. If you ever want to see an interesting project, uh, they, the city of London did a, challenge to their staff in arenas and every arena challenged each other to, for energy reduction and they give each staff two days holidays for which arena gets the most energy reduction that's an ongoing event and it is amazing what people do when they are a stakeholder and it's it's really nothing but the outcome is tremendous and they're saving thousands and thousands of dollars annually in arenas with the same stuff technology that they used before the staff are just using it thank you uh sue i noticed you had your hand up earlier and then it uh, vanished again i don't want to uh leave you hanging there i was just going to ask um you talked about refurbishing outdoor pools and the question i have is what how many outdoor pools do you normally refurbish and is it cost efficient to do that like uh sue yeah sue, dude sue Dufresne. uh good to meet you sue um so sure. we have several um and it really depends on the the location and the integrity of the existing pool it certainly is easier than ripping a facility out uh, particularly if the bathhouse is in reasonable shape and you can just upgrade it to uh, accessibility standards, which is always part of the reason why you refurbish, right? So it doesn't meet the needs of the community today and does it, uh, what do we have to, to knock out to make it that, that way? Uh, I would say, well, I can tell you, Dorchester Pool had a huge, they had as much space as they wanted. They chose to use the same footprint because of where it was uh, and rather ripping it down and uh, taking it out. In the case of Exeter, they wanted that pool exactly where it was because they were building on behind it. They built a, a big region, uh, we'll say regional park for their area, but uh, they built a big spray pad in behind and a whole park area and they wanted that in that footprint. They didn't really have another space to do it in, in the vicinity. 
so those are good reasons to do it, to leave it. And generally, the pool's in a spot that, pe that the community wanted it in the first place, so they generally wanted to keep it there. So refurbishing it in place, uh, it, is, it is cheaper for multiple reasons. Uh, if the pool is absolutely done, it's where the concrete is all gone, because we actually put a pool inside the existing structure, that's actually what we do, and you, you only lose a little bit of the pool. It's brilliant technology. Uh, we can bring it right up to standard, all those things. And again, I'll, I'll share some pictures of it. You would not know that it's a refurbished pool. You would think that somebody knocked it all down. Uh, I was involved in several pools where we, we did refurbish them and what happened, or excuse me, we re did rebuild them for various reasons. Uh, sometimes we were stuck because of the mandate for which we uh, uh, got the money. We had to rip them out. We even, we had a pool that we didn't want to rip out, but we weren't going to get funding from it uh, municipally because of the way it was written in the project, uh, unless we actually ripped it out. It was a crazy thing. Sorry, it's municipal government at its best, I'll say that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, it, you know, where refurbishment would have been a better plan, we actually ended up ripping it out. It wasn't really done, but uh, if that happens. It really depends on the project. Uh, the uh, YMCA in downtown Toronto is an indoor pool. They they ripped they refurbished on site. They didn't. Uh, they have 50, 60, uh, actually might be 70 year old building, and we put in a refurbished pool in uh, Mirtha pool in there, uh, renovated. It's brilliant, right? Uh, Vaughn put in a, a an out and again an indoor where they actually took a 12 feet deep pool and we filled up the deep end and made it more of a community pools because all that was dead space. They weren't using the dive well really anymore. It was just dead space water. So we actually filled in the dive well, made a new run of action inside the existing template. Uh, I, I, can I just ask you this one? Sure. Question, though, is the part is like, I just want to go on record for you guys, outstanding presentation and to refurbish the indoor rec center at the rec center, is crazy because of the air quality. Right, and when it gets too big. Right. It's too old, and I can't imagine, I, I can't wait for Norfolk County to look at building a new pool for our area, for the part of community for all. And, and so with older facilities, I'm sure, I actually, I apologize, I haven't been down to Norfolk to see the facility, and I, I wanted to, and just because of the times we're living in, I haven't gotten there. and. Uh, there comes a point I always look at when you have a 12 year old or a 14 year old car and you go fix it or let it go right when you have that and and sometimes you have to let it go and particularly with our building structures they're getting too old and and they're just not viable uh, to just replace an HVAC system and an indoor pool is a couple million dollars you know and and then the it, it, beyond that the accessibility and the turnover rate the code the meeting code how do you make all that work uh, and then the, the entire footprint. So with, you can yeah. always make anything work, but is it the right decision? Yeah. Scott, you referenced yeah. visiting a pool and you asked them what happened to the rest of it. I, I thought that's when you were visiting Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's tough when, when things go wrong. And getting everybody on board and you know I, I don't know if there's any counselors on today uh, it's tough for council to think you know bigger than than their four years right you got it what i want to really improve our community and uh maybe i'm not supposed to say that out loud but it's sometimes sort of thinking and it it derails a lot of really good projects and and really we have to think bigger with what scott Bokey was talking about with you know energy projects it's not a one day or a one weeker Right. This is this is the life of your community you're developing, and and you have to have a, a really solid thinking to to be a to be a winner in that in that field. And it, touche on you, that one. Yeah, <laughs> Scott, I should have introduced you to uh, Councillor Ian and Councillor Amy uh, at the beginning there. Yeah. Just to, uh, I, I, and I apologize. Sure I, I, I just it's just the way yeah. it is, and I know it's it's a tough one, and uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's a hard, hard pill to swallow, but it, but it is really for the greater good. I, I would always say. Gord, you have your hand up. 
Uh, I do. I don't have any questions uh, for the two Scots. So I would just like to say thank you. Uh, yeah, very insightful. Uh, I'm not a pool guy in particular or a techie guy in particular, but definitely learned a lot from what you had to say. Uh, so thank you. And then if I can just make one comment more on our side of the table, um, because I think I just want to plant a seed. We don't want to get into a conversation, of course, but uh, Ian, you mentioned accessibility and the whole idea of more drop-in facilities for the community. Uh, couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that this committee, as it goes forward and whatever form it goes forward, that can be an area that we really address, whether it's for our existing facilities or hopefully a new facility not too far in our, in our future. Um, accessibility it includes just knowing when something's available, when you can plug and play and bring your kids over and do something, et cetera. And, and right now, one major challenge we have in Norfolk County is the community knowing when our facilities are open and available. We do not have a user-friendly uh, interface to actually uh, engage with our, our facilities, whether that's pools or arenas or anything or community halls, et cetera. Um, and I know in the short term, we're going to be looking, you're going to be reviewing uh, user fees and looking at net levies and how do we lower the net levies. Um, increasing user fees is a sledgehammer that raising fees is is a significant barrier to accessibility in itself. And wouldn't it be better if we could just reduce the net levy by increasing utilization and increasing participation? And I think one, one thing that this committee could look to uh, to assisting with uh, with revised terms of reference uh, and, and going into the new year is is that type of system that could really help increase participation uh, and utilization of our assets and driving up health of our community and revenue um, without increasing user fees necessarily, but by increasing that accessibility. And as Scott mentioned, staff in the pool having uh, you know information on their phone and everything else, that's the way things are going. And we have a very antiquated system for, for connecting the community with our facilities now. And whether that's existing facilities or new ones, I think there's a role to play. In, and driving that forward, we could be doing, be doing a lot better than we are. Anyway, just planting a seed on that one. Sorry for the commentary. I have one final question for Scott V. Um, Norfolk County uh, has uh, had, we're a very dispersed county. Um, so we're, we're having a little bit of a tough time selling the county on the concept of centralized facilities. Um, that was one of, the, one, one of the reasons that I was looking at the, the concept of uh, splitting the energy as a service away from uh, the, the, the actual uh, facility itself. Um, with that in mind, um, have you ever considered something like uh, uh, running a um, a heat pump out of uh, hockey arenas in one area and uh, running the energy as a service there and then uh, running the pool in another location uh, and running uh, the energy as a service there and trying to balance it out so that uh, there was uh, like a uh, not necessarily a neutral uh, energy offset but uh, you know the, the two cancelled each other out somewhat is that even feasible or is it uh, beyond uh, beyond anything that anybody's conceived of? It depends. Um, so in a multi-rec facility where you have a pool and an, an arena, yeah, you, you basically use the waste heat from one to, to service the other. What you're talking about in terms of them being at different facilities, different addresses, I have not seen, with the exception of something very uh, sizable. So um, this was actually just announced in Niagara region, but in um, South Carolina, we run a uh, landfill gas plant and we take the waste methane and pipe it about two kilometers north to a BMW manufacturing facility. Uh, which uses the energy. Now that's a considerable amount of energy, far greater than than what you're talking about. That makes that economic. Um, so it seems quite doubtful um, that what you're talking about would be economic, given the small scale of the facilities that are potentially in play in Norfolk County. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, final final saved rounds for uh, Scott and Scott. 
Gentlemen, I thank you very much. Thank you. It was an awesome discussion. And thank you so much, everyone. And thanks, Scott Volke, for joining us today. And thank you for the invitation, Paul, and, and to you and your, your group. Good luck. We will uh, talk again. And uh, I think, think you're on the right track for sure. OK, thank you so much, guys. And uh, if you'll uh, exit the conversation, um, what I'd like to do, Jacob, uh, is uh, host a, uh, a, a working group just to uh, discuss the nature of uh, uh, our terms of reference. Uh, if uh, the uh, other uh, members would like to uh, just hold on for uh, a little bit. Uh, does that sound good to everybody? Ian, good? Gord, you good? I, I'm for, personally, I do. Oh, Gord, you got to go? I, I yeah, I do. I have to run, actually. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll hold on to that. Uh, um, but uh, Scott and Scott, uh, thank you again. And uh, you guys have cleared off any time, and uh, greatly appreciate it, Scott. I'll be in contact with you uh, at some point uh, in the early new year. Sounds great. Thank you. Take care. Happy holidays to everyone, and uh, be safe. Bye bye. Thank you, Amy. Uh, uh, we'll stick around. Uh, Sue, can you stick around for a little bit? Did I lose Sue? So Sorry, Paul. I'll have to hang up. I do have to get on the road pretty quick. Okay, Gord. Uh, thanks for uh, attending. We'll talk to you later. Cheers. Can I propose uh, that we take a uh, three or four minute bio break uh, before we uh, resume? The tea is running through me. Sounds good. See you in five. Okay. Cheers. We'll uh, we'll reconvene at uh, say seventeen uh, twenty seven. Jacob, are you still hanging in here? I'm still here, correct. OK, uh, this is a, a working group meeting now, and uh, your services uh, recording uh, things are not required for working group meetings. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if you can leave without uh, canceling all of us or whether uh, you have to hang in there. So I, I just want to get your uh, 
your opinion, what you want to do, and uh, make sure that I'm not uh, unnecessarily holding you up from other activities. Sorry, I missed that first part there, Paul. Sorry, I'm just looking at the options here. I believe I can leave without ending the meeting for the three of you. Okay, fantastic. We'll uh, we'll uh, hold on then, and uh, thank you so much for uh, hanging in there during the presentation. No problem. I'll try and figure out a way to get that uh, posted up to the RFAB website um, so that uh, everybody uh, who has an interest can benefit from uh, Scott and Scott's uh, expertise there. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. And.